You're listening to Long Distance. I'm Paula Mardo. Please be advised, this episode contains graphic descriptions of torture and a mention of suicide. If you haven't listened to the first part of this story, press pause. Find the episode Mirla Part 1, The Underground. Listen to that, then come back here. It'll make much more sense if you do. On this episode, we continue the story of Mirla Baldonado. After martial law is declared in the Philippines in 1972, Mirla leaves her family to become a full-time activist, part of the underground resistance against the dictatorship of Ferdinand Marcos. Mirla's family moves to Canada and later the United States. They have minimal contact, mostly to send her money. While this isn't the place to get into the intricacies of Philippine politics, it's important to know that there were many groups fighting against the Marcos regime and U.S. imperialism at this time. Communists, anti-imperialists, students, sometimes they worked together. Mirla was part of the National Democratic Front, which is the political arm of the Communist Party of the Philippines. But she considered herself a nationalist democrat, pro-democracy, against U.S. imperialism, fascism, and feudalism. Back then, activists had to work underground because under the dictatorship and martial law, their work was illegal subversive. As an activist, Mirla's job is organizing, mostly poor folks, workers, and students. The work is dangerous. She uses different aliases in different neighborhoods, so if one name is compromised, she'd know where the leak came from. The work is hard, but for Mirla, fulfilling. She likes working with young people especially. She even adopts some of them later in life. In 1983, while organizing around the old U.S. naval base in Subic Bay, near a city called Olongapo, she meets a poor high school student named Ariel. We were trying to break through our organizing in the public high school. So he was the key contact, Ariel. And I took pity of him because he doesn't have food where he lives. He doesn't even have transportation to go to school. I would go up the hill to give him food, something to use to go to school. Part of the money that was coming from my father from Canada that was feeding everyone in our unit, I gave some of it to him. One day, I was supposed to meet this student Near a hospital, I went to the library and read some newspapers. And then I realized, as I was reading, that there were two other heavyset men at the entrance of the library. They're intensely monitoring me. And then I tried to get up, and they also got up. And I thought, oh my God, this is it. So when I got out of the library, I saw the kid that I was supposed to meet. I didn't want him to be arrested. So I was giving him a look that's saying something like, don't come close to me. And he didn't. And then they accosted me. And they wanted me to go to a, to a vehicle. And they said I was arrested. For what? Oh my God, you're on denial. Nagmamaang-maangang ka pa, so you're on denial. And then, I was thinking of running, but if I run, they might shoot me and then say that I was trying to escape. So I just went along with them and went to the vehicle. And then I said, so where are you bringing me? That's when they started blindfolding me. take me to the fields. Later on, I only learned that it was San Felipe in Zambales, an hour driving from Longapo City. So that was a rural area. That was where they interrogated me and tortured me. Mirla, part two. The safe house. Yeah, it was a bungalow. A small house, and 
I was tied to the bed. I had two guards, and then they would pick me up every early morning or dawn. I don't know exactly what time, but I think the whole neighborhood is asleep. And they would pick me up and bring me to the farm, and they would do water torture. That first night when they picked me up and brought me there, they already tortured me. They made me lie down on the bench, tied my hands and my feet, and then they would draw water from the well and put a cloth on my mouth and pour water continuously until they would stop and ask me, who are you working with? Who are these names? If I don't respond, they would do it again. I did some meditation so I could bear the water because it's so difficult, water continuously coming in and you have to hold your breath. It's either you swallow the water but you don't take in the water into your nose, then you're going to drown. So I thought that I would close my eyes and there would be like small specks and then I would concentrate on one speck and then I would faint. And then they would wake me up again. There were times when I would fake it, that I fainted, but I did not actually. When your belly gets bloated, they ride on your belly, and it's like the water goes up and down. They ride on you. So that when the water is pouring, it would not come out. It's so painful that way, and difficult and scary. I was thinking of, if I say one name, then everyone will be in danger. It's the worst thing I could do. And yeah, and I fear for the people, like the students that I'm organizing, they won't be able to finish college. For this happening so many times already, I had to protect myself that I don't sleep anymore because I don't want to wake up to that feeling that, you know, they're coming again to get me. I would sleep in the daytime <laughs> then, because I knew it would happen again, you know, early morning when I'm caught unaware. For the two weeks that they held me, they were doing it every other morning. So what's happening was it was increasing. And there was a training going on while they were torturing me. There was an officer that came. I know he was higher than them. And he was teaching people how to do it properly. And they were saying something like, we don't care if you're going to give names or point places. You just get this. Tanggapin mo lang to. Wala kami pakialam. Magsasalita ka o hindi. They will keep torturing me, increasing it. And they used to let me use my shoes. And this time, they were not letting me use my shoes anymore. It was like they were trying to tell me that this is the end. And I felt like they were being more rough to me. What's working in my mind was, okay, this is it. I'm not going to say any word. And then, I'll just prepare. What did you think was going to happen? That they were going to kill me. But then what happened was, they talked to me. So I was thinking, I will craft something. When they try to ask me a question, I will appear like I was cooperating. But I will have a storyline. But if that storyline is not accepted, I have to accept that this is the end for me. (laughs) 
When they started asking where I was living in Alongapo City, I thought that I would say where. Anyway, before I left that place, I told this woman, I'm leaving your place. If something happens and they ask about me, tell them you don't know anything about me. The policy is if somebody gets arrested, nobody goes to that place anymore. So I think I'm safe. So when they ask the question, where do you live? I could give that out without having others harmed. I did some drama like, Sir, that person who lives there, she's pregnant. She was pregnant when I left and she doesn't know what's happening to me. Can you be an officer and gentleman not to hurt this person? Of course we will be. That was the plan. More after the break. I'm your host, Paula Mardo. Tune in to Long Distance at longdistanceradio.com. Hey, Patrick. What's up? What you doing? Working on an episode of Long Distance TV, the video documentary companion series to Long Distance Podcast. Cool. So what does it actually take to make Long Distance TV? Well, after we figure out the story, I have to shoot, log footage, and edit, and edit. Right. And And there's sound design, mixing, color correction, uploading. That's a lot of work. Yeah. What about you? What does it take to make the podcast? I got to do research, pre-interviews, book interviews, record interviews, transcribe and log tape, write, sound design, and edit, and edit, and Hmm, edit. Sounds familiar. Yep, but we love working on this, right? And thankfully, this season, we have support from the Google Podcast Creator Program and from some of our long-distance listeners. Cool. So if listeners want to support the show, how do they do it? The best way to support Long Distance is to join the Long Distance Radio Club Patreon. It's a membership platform where you can support us while we make the show with special perks and updates. I can confirm there are special perks and updates. But there are other ways to help too. You can share the show on social media and in real life or rate and review it on Apple Podcasts. Head to longdistanceradio.com slash support to find other ways to help. Now back to the show. All right. Edit and edit and edit and edit and edit. Can I ask you, so... I just want to be clear. So this story that you told, you were able to say the real place where you lived in Alangapo because you know that those people had already left. Even that woman that you said was pregnant, was she real? Yeah, she's real. Okay. And then I checked on her after because I was thinking, was she hurt or something? No, they didn't even come close to her. So this storyline of ready to cooperate a little bit, was a good opening, and later on, I was brought to regular detention, to the camp. Yeah, okay. so we were held in a jail that's within a Philippine constabulary camp. They call Camp Makinaya. But the jail is being run by the Philippine National Police, and the jail is intended for common crime violators. It's not a political camp like Krame. I mean, usually they keep political detainees together, but the facilities are not good. Supposedly, it should be also with women political detainees. But I was the only one. We were called POV, public order violators. I remember that as a public order violator, I could not even get bailed. We were not given the right to even defend ourselves in court. So there was a time when they were still taking me from the solitary confinement to be interviewed in the intelligence office during nighttime or being ready in regular detention and still being accosted out for interrogation. Being in solitary confinement was still a part of the torture. It's more psychological because you're being kept there alone and being threatened to be killed. I 
at this moment did you feel because you said that there were moments especially during martial law and when you were tortured even I'm sure um, that you felt why am I doing this where am I going what's going to happen all those thoughts I did not allow during those times oh really it was not a time to be doubtful of what I'm doing so even when you were tortured you weren't that way yeah I wasn't that way I had to be strong I know because otherwise it would break me so I did not entertain any thoughts of feeling pity for myself I had to be above this I think even in isolation I did entertain myself reading how to make a pineapple candy and I was laughing over the fact that I almost like wanted to make the candy without the pineapple so I did not entertain any of those thoughts of after this I'm going to you know, live normally or something. I just kept my passion for the justice work that I'm doing. And yeah, that kept me alive. So the common law wife of one of my captors, the one who was guarding me in the safe house, knew about me because she went to that place when I was still in a safe house. She was looking for her husband. And they said, oh, he's guarding somebody. And then through the grapevine, she learned that they were guarding me. And so she went there. I heard her voice, and the husband was so mad at her. And then, when I was transferred from that safe house and brought to the camp, I was brought to an isolation cell, which was close to the where the wives and the common law wives of my arresting officers lived. So it's just very close. They live very close to me. And they would hear what's happening, and they would talk who I am and stuff like that. One night, a ball pen was dropped into the isolation cell where I was staying. With that pen was taped a letter saying, I'm the common law wife of the one who arrested you. I pity you for what's happening to you. If you could tell me the address of your family, I could contact them and tell them where you are. And then the person who told the military about me was Ariel. And that was the kid who was there as I was coming out of the library, the one whom I helped. So he was the one who tipped the military about me. I didn't realize was the nephew of an intelligence officer. And that's when I vomited a lot because of the betrayal. I vomited for a moment and was feeling a great sadness over the betrayal. And then I thought, is this for real? Is she not going to give this address? And then I said, again, this is another opening. Because I know that people, if they knew that I was missing, they would not go to our house anymore. And so I took the chance. I gave my address. I used the pen and the paper and threw it out. And she picked it up. 
That's how my family was able to locate me. I learned from the Amnesty International that they were already increasing their petition to the Philippine government to surface me because my sister got in touch with human rights groups. My case landed in the sala of a very, I think, progressive judge who was anti-Marcos. So he fast-tracked the case. I had a human rights lawyer defending me. I had a good defense. What was the charge against you? So I was charged with subversion, meaning bringing down the state. That was the reason why I couldn't be bailed out. And I was framed up with a fragmentation grenade. They found me in possession of a grenade. I don't even know the difference between a fragmentation grenade and other types of grenade. And then when the the judge asked me, I said I only saw it in court, Your Honor. They brought it out? Yeah. And the judge was saying, remove that from court because it might explode. And so I won the case. The judge saying in his judgment that the court cannot be at peace with mere recognition of her innocence. So the court highly condemns the brutal and inhuman treatment that was accorded to her. And they recommended that I file counter charges against my arresting officers, which I didn't do anymore because that would mean like I would be going back to the place for the hearings and they would be retaliating. I didn't want to go through that again. It was already 1985, very close to 1986. There was a very high feelings of bringing down Marcos. Now, Channel 10 News update. Good evening. The sun has now set tonight on the Philippines that for the very first time in over 20 years is not being ruled by Ferdinand Marcos. The former president fled today to the island of Guam. He's being examined tonight at the U.S. Naval Hospital there. Marcos left the Philippines aboard a U.S. Air Force jet with former military commander Fabian Ver and an entourage of 55 the White House has now recognized Corazon Aquino's government, and tonight the acting governor of Guam is saying that Marcos will leave his island tomorrow, possibly for a life of exile in Hawaii. In Manila tonight, it's a revolution many are calling a toast to democracy. It's for the most part nonviolent and for the most part joyous. <laughs> Tens of thousands of people poured through the streets of Manila and other large cities all day and all night. They danced and sang and chanted the name of their new president, Corazon Aquino. We are finally free and we can be truly proud of the unprecedented way we achieved our freedom. We Americans like to think we taught the Filipinos democracy. Well, tonight, they're teaching the world. Were you there at People Power? Oh, I wasn't there. I was still healing from the trauma. I couldn't even go to a crowd because I'm used to only small spaces. I went back to nonprofit work, but I wasn't really fully back in action. And also, there was a debate about is EDSA real change? Because as you recall, we were fighting against not just the dictatorship, but also against imperialism, no longer being a neo-colony of the U.S. It didn't happen. When you look at the Philippines right now, do you feel like what you fought for, I don't know, did anything? The work you were doing? Hmm. That's a tough question. Uh, well... <laughs> I couldn't see myself going through another arrest, abduction, and torture. My biggest problem of going back to the work that I was doing was probably not committing a suicide before they arrest me. So all these things were working in my mind. Nevertheless, I thought the reason why I got into it was because of my, my passion to be part of, you know, the changes in Philippine society, so why should I stop? 
I just went back to the work and found myself building my carriage again. That was the reason why I got back into theater. It's like finding yourself again. This administration has done a lot to push back on the victories that we have won. But I, I stay positive that the will of the people will eventually emerge when, at the proper time, bringing people together to overcome another type of, you know, dictatorship. According to figures from Amnesty International, from 1972 to 1981, some 70,000 people were imprisoned, 34,000 were tortured, and over 3,200 were killed in the Philippines under martial law. Martial law was lifted on January 17, 1981. Mirla was imprisoned from 1983 to 1985. The EDSA People Power Revolution began on February 22, 1986. Mirla split her time with her family in the U.S. and the Philippines. She eventually got back into activist work. And over the years, she's worked on big campaigns like closing down the U.S. naval bases and getting them cleaned up. In the early 2000s, while working as a caregiver in Chicago, Mirla was diagnosed with PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, for the torture she endured. She went through five years of rehabilitation at the Marjorie Kovler Center for Torture Victims. She now lives in Los Angeles, where she works on improving the working and living conditions of domestic workers and caregivers, many of whom are Filipino. In 2013, Mirla was honored as a champion for change by the White House for her efforts as an Asian American Pacific Islander woman leader. In 2018, she and more than 11,000 victims of human rights violations under martial law received monetary compensation. I asked her if it was enough. She says it wasn't, not for what she lost. I've known Mirla for a couple years, and this is definitely only a part of her incredible life story. But it's obviously a big part that has, in many ways, shaped the way she views the world and her place in it. She tells me that through all of this, she's gained resilience and only wants to do more, to help people, create change. It's an optimistic way of looking at things, given all that's happened. But to Mirla, it's the only way to look at it. This episode was written, edited, mixed, and hosted by me, Paul Amardo. Long Distance is produced by Patrick Apino and me. You can learn more about this story in the show notes on our website, longdistanceradio.com. This season of Long Distance is produced with support from PRX and the Google Podcast Creator Program, as well as our donors on PayPal and our Patreon members, supporters, and ambassadors. To learn more about supporting the show, head to longdistanceradio.com slash support. Music in this episode is by Blue Dot Sessions. Theme song is by Sea Light and the Prisms. Special thanks to my parents and to Mirla. If you like this episode, share it with a friend or family member or on social media. Don't forget to tag us. That's it for now. Thanks for listening. <laughs>